now we have our second um, session today, and um, I'd like to very warmly welcome our panel for the First Nations uh, session. And I'm going to introduce Heather, Heather McGregor, who is the director of um, First Nations Student Success from Charles Sturt University. Heather is going to facilitate the next panel session, learning from First Nations students, and uh, will introduce panel members to us. Over to you, Heather. Okay, thank you very much. And before I go any further, I'd like to um, pay my respects to the traditional owners and custodians and elders of the lands or countries that we're all collectively joining from today. I'm sure it's quite a range of areas given the virtual nature of this um, session. Um, I think this is a very exciting session to hear from a First Nations uh, panel. My role is working directly with um, teams that support First Nations students. So I feel honored to be a facilitator today. Um, I'm joining here um, from Birupai country, so I'd also like to acknowledge Birupai people. Um, the topic um, that the panel have been asked to consider is how do we embed First Nations ways of knowing, doing and understanding and how we progress student partnership work within our institutions and the tertiary education sector. Uh, we've got three speakers to hear from for about 10 minutes each and then there'll be some time for questions and answers. Um, so I don't want to take up any more time. I'll um, jump straight into the, the first speaker. So Keenan, um, Keenan Smith is the National Union of Students Indigenous Officer and the Flinders University Student Association First Nations Officer. Um, and I'll hand over to you now, Keenan. Hattie, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Uh, thank you for that welcome, Heather. Um, as Heather was saying, my name is Keenan. Um, I'm a Wirrungal, Mooning and Gugger, the person from the far west coast of South Australia. Um, and I use they, them pronouns. And I'm currently in my final year of an environmental sciences degree at Flinders University. Um, I'm ringing in from Ghana country, so I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional owners from the land that I'm speaking on. Um, so I guess, um, I could just probably start with a quick, um, I guess, bio about how I kind of got into Stupol or uh, student politics. Um, I noticed at my universities um, that there was a lack of, um, well, there was little to no, um, I guess, processes or stuff in place that made um, the way that my role was elected culturally safe, if that makes sense. Um, and I kept getting told over and over again, or um, we can't we can't do this, we can't do that. And I had to constantly remind them that like that these policies and regulations that were put in place were were not created with us in mind. So how and how is that fair for us if these if these if these policies were written in mind of the wider student population and not directly for First Nations students and how that is a form of institutional racism because the institution is making these laws and not really taking consideration um, us, I guess. Um, so that kind of segues into kind of, I guess, the, the topic of how do we embed First Nations in ways of knowing, doing, understanding, and how we progress student partnership work within our institutions and tertiary education sector. Um, so I guess from my experiences as a, as a First Nations student at university, um, one way that, well, one thing that I've always done was trying to find ways where it's in my assignment. So when I'm at a lecture, how can I incorporate First Nations knowledge into what I'm doing? Um, and so like some simple things that I've done, like if it's an assignment based on a locality, like I've, I've, I've acknowledged the traditional owners of that area. Um, even when I did an assignment based on Kwangdong, um, and my people eat Hong Kong and where we're from, we call them bra. So like I spoke a bit about that kind of history and stuff like that. There's, there's little things like that, that that could be done. And I think on a higher level, um, I went to a reconciliation breakfast this morning that was hosted, um, hosted by Reconciliation South Australia. And we had people like um, Karen Mundine, who's the CEO of Reconciliation Australia. And we had a professor, Simone Olagatu, who's the Vice Chancellor for Indigenous at my university at Flinders. And one of the statements that she had made in, um, in order for reps to be effective is that organizations and institutions have to acknowledge 
the role that they have had and still play in colonisation, um, which I think is very important to universities because in the past universities have notoriously been spaces where its work has often been to our detriment as First Nations people. And many of the ideas around race, religion, I guess racial superiority um, came from these came from these institutions, like well, came from universities and have led to, to the creation of policies and actions that were ultimately made to either contain or eradicate us. Um, so I think that's also a good point when looking at universities is looking at like its kind of role in the past and also the role that it still has in, in a lot of these ideas. Um, yeah. Um, and like I was saying before, when it came down to my experiences with student politics and I kept hearing, I, I kept hearing those excuses or those answers such as all right, policies or regulations don't allow us to do that. Well, abolish them. Like, I've, like, like I said before, like these, these things were created not in mind of us, but in mind for everyone else. And I think another thing with, um, with ways of knowing and doing, especially from our perspective, um, and those include like our, our shared histories. So being uncomfortable is, is, is a part of this process. So often these conversations, they're not always gonna be rainbows and butterflies, like they are quite unsettling and uncomfortable. Um, even as First Nations people, like often to hear our own histories, and even when it's like, histories that are from our own people like I come from an area where we've had a massacre site and like even as a First Nations person hearing that like I'm often quite unsettled and it, it is quite sad because it's my people that were ultimately killed off but um, I think once we get to that point where we can have those conversations that are unsettling and uncomfortable then we can get to a point where we've acknowledged and engaged with it then we can get to a point where we can address it and get to a point where solutions can, can, can start being done and created um yeah i guess i don't really know what else to say i guess i've always been a strong advocate for um having stuff in place that's going to ensure cultural safety for first nation students and staff and people um when we engage and come into universities a lot of us have come from places where there's been a lot of barriers that have prevented us from getting there well, not prevent us from getting there but i've kind of made our journey a lot harder to get to universities. You know, like a lot of us often are coming, are like the first ones in my family to go to university or um, we've, had a lot, we've had a lot of stuff against us getting to university. Um, so I think the last thing we need is coming to these spaces where, where either we're pitted against one another or there are teaching and learning spaces that are quite unsafe and we're being taught, um, I guess, this engaging with these topics where they're describing us as being in the past or being the other. And I think that also needs a change. And I think universities are shifting in, in the right direction when it comes to not othering us. Um, yeah, I guess from a student polit politics side of thing, um, the one thing that I'd like to see um, and this is through my experiences with NUS and also through UAXIS, which I'm the outgoing president for, um, is more cohesion of student bodies in our respective state and territory. So I guess engaging um, within the universities, but also allowing university Indigenous students or First Nations students from each university to, to engage with one another and um, to kind of get together and discuss like, what are our issues and problems on campus. Um, I think this will ensure better ad advocacy and understanding of our issues and problems and lead to better solutions. Because um, what might work in one state or territory might not necessarily work in another. I guess as First Nations people, we are quite diverse and often there are things that are universal amongst us, but then there are issues and stuff that are that are unique to our regions. Um, yeah, I don't know <laughs> really what else to say. Um, so I'll leave it there. Okay, well, thank you very much, Keenan, for sharing your point of view. And um, when we get to the Q&A, you might think of a few more things you want to add, but really appreciate everything that you have put forward. I can certainly hear a lot of parallels in what you've shared and um, what we hear from students in our university as well. So a lot of important issues that you've brought up there. Um, we might move on to our second panel member then. So we're um, keeping as much time as we can at the end for questions. Um, so Mama Roira um, Marita is the past co-president of Taimana Akangang, 
Um, I apologise for any incorrect pronunciation there, um, but I'll hand over to you now to uh, explain a little bit more about yourself and share your point of view. Kia ora. Um, ko mō mairo a media tu ahau, hiureo no Ngāti Pukiao me Ngāti Whakaui. Uh, I am a past president of the Māori Tertiary Students Association, um, the National Māori Tertiary Students Association, um, as well as a past president of the Māori Students Association of the University of Auckland. Um, I did make a slideshow, but I think I might just go off cuff here and um, talk to you guys informally. Um, but my um, before I actually talk about how I started in student politics, I, I, I will actually introduce myself. So, uh, ko matafaura te maunga, ko rotuiti te moana, ko ohau te awa, ko te arawa te waka, ko te arawa te iwi, ko ngāti pikiao, me ngāti whikaue te hapu. So that right there um, is my pepeha, and it shows my, um, my genealogical links to the land and to the, um, my mountain, Matafauda, um, my, uh, my lake, Rotuiti, um, my river, Oho, and is alongside my uh, waka that my ancestors came to Aotearoa on, Te Arua. And I am a proud member of um, the Te Arua tribe, um, alongside the Ngāti Pigao and Ngāti Whakaue sub-tribe. So sorry, it might be a little bit fast for you guys learning this language, um, but that's who I am. Um, and that's the, 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 the history that came before me. And that's, um, yeah, I'm very happy to have been born into this. Um, but my journey into student politics started at the University of Auckland as a Bachelor of Health Science student. Uh, it, um, we have uh, Māori student associations at all eight of our universities in New Zealand. Uh, and it just so happened that we were, I'd been a, a pretty active member of my Māori Student Association and we were getting to um, our AGM when we, when we voted new presidents. Um, so it was around that time that I got asked to step up and take on a leadership role. Um, and at first I actually wasn't too, um, I was still quite new to the whole student politics scene and what, you know, what governance looked like and what, um, what input our Māori students had. Um, but I stepped in wanting to make a change and a difference for Tawira Māori in, in tertiary education. Um, so Tawira is just students. Um, as soon as I stepped into the role, I, I started taking on um, different, I took on um, quite a few leadership positions. So I sat on the academic board known as Senate for the University of Auckland. Um, I also sat on the discipline committee for the University of Auckland as well. Um, and in every group where they needed um, Māori voice or even student voice, I was fortunate enough to have been given a seat and to be able to sit at that governance level to, to advocate for the students that I represented. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough to have um, all of these opportunities given to me. And so um, as I talk today, I, I talk from those experiences. But one thing I do want to touch on to before I actually jump into Māori student voices that um, I can only talk about um, the experiences of Māori. So I know that our experiences here in New Zealand and Aotearoa are remarkably different than um, our cousins over in Ahitereiria, than the tangata whenua there. Um, so that's one thing I do just want to remind everyone is we have a, a huge difference, and especially in regards to the fact that we have Te Tiriti, our founding, our founding document. So that's one clear, clear point I want to um, yeah, share with you when I talk. Um, but I stepped into these roles, yes, quite green, um, but I started realising that um, a lot of work needed to be done to ensure that Māori student voice um, was being heard and being included, but that the engagement with Māori students was actually authentic. And so I started at a, at a regional level at a single university, um, but after a year advocating in this space, um, I saw that there needed to be a lot of work done nationally. And so I ended up stepping into um, Te Mana Akunga, the Māori student, the National Māori Students Association. Um, I do want to kind of break down some of the, the experiences and the challenges and some of the opportunities. But um, before I go into that, I, I'll give a quick breakdown of the structure of Te Mana Akunga. So at the University of Auckland, we have Ngā Tawira Māori, the Māori Students Association. And they are just one branch of a much larger tree. And that tree is Te Mana Akunga, our National Māori, Māori Students Association. 
Um, each university has a, has a branch. So we're very fortunate enough to have strong Māori student voice in our universities. Um, and we do have a few polytechnics in there. Um, in the session before us, I know Andrew talked about te pūkinga and the reforms to, um, to the vocational education frame, uh, system. Uh, that's, that has hugely impacted us. And so we don't have as much as strong a Māori student voice in that space, given the, the huge changes that's happened there. But in regards to Māori student voice, we still manage to have four polytechnics linked into Te Mana Akunga. So hopefully I'm painting a clear picture, but we have this tree here um, of Māori student voice and representatives across the country. Now, how it works is that at each individual institution and organisation, so our universities and our polytechnics, um, our associations decide amongst themselves who would be their best leaders or, you know, who's going to be the executive or the core group of students that will be um, mandated to speak on behalf of those students. And so those are known as our kaiarahi or our caretakers, which is a trans literal um, translation. Um, what we have with our tree is all of those different executives that are voted into, um, into their executives by their peers come together to form this tree and that's what makes Te Mana Akunga. So that's our Māori student network of, of student ex Māori student executives that work together really to advocate for students, to represent students and to make sure that Māori student interests are heard, not just at the regional level, but at the national level. Um, and so I had, I came through that tree really. I was a small little branch at first and then I magically ended up being the president for a few years there. Um, one thing I want to touch on is that um, historically, it was around about the 60s, we didn't have a formalized Māori student voice that you'd see right now um, for a long time, really. It wasn't until around the 60s, 70s that we started having Māori student protests uh, that actually led to the form formalizations of these, these Māori student associations at the regional level. Um, so I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but there's um, an incident known as the Haka Party incident. And I think some of our First Nations might have heard of that. Um, where in the 70s, um, some of our Māori students were overwhelmed with um, non-Māori students um, making a mockery of our culture, that there was actually an altercation there. And, and that was actually um, the formation of one of our student associations. So just to give you some, some update, that, that's where we were founded from, from, um, from Māori students um, not feeling like their voices were heard and recognising that they needed to actually not just come together, but actually formally, yeah, formalise their groups so that they could make sure that um, that when it came to the best interests of Māori students, there was a clear structure there that could be um, sustained and followed. And so that's that's the whakapapa from which Te Mana Akunga comes from. Now, I do apologise. I realise I use Māori words really fast and I, I recognise not everyone here is going to be an expert. So in the panel time, just um, you can ask me to clarify some of these words, sorry. But um, in regards to our mahi, it came from um, our, our older students, our older generations, not being happy with the way things were, and that's, that's where we step in. Um, in regards to Te Mana Akunga at present, again, we have 14, um, linking back to the universities and the polytechnics, we actually have 14 Māori tertiary student associations across Aotearoa, so we have a strong network. Um, but it looks different at each institution. So I mentioned earlier about how I was fortunate enough to sit on our academic board for the University of Auckland and how I was fortunate enough to have those opportunities. Uh, there's only one other university that actually has a seat written for their Māori student leader to, to have those same opportunities. Um, in most instances, Māori student voice is actually very limited. And um, we have a huge problem here with the non-Māori student presidents um, everything automatically going to them and us, you know, being left with what, whatever scraps there are to, you know, whatever scraps there are left for us. So that, that's one big challenge that we're finding over here is that how our systems work is we're often, I think Andrew briefly touched on it in his corridor, we're often fighting amongst other students for resources. And so that's, that's a huge problem across the board with all of our student associations is we find ourselves um, in contention with our non-Maori student leaders um, because we're both battling really just to get the best for our students and and that's one of our huge that's one huge weakness that I want to touch on. Um, another thing is that with our Māori student leaders um, we found that in most instances we're ignored we're forgotten or we're excluded 
from governance positions and from boards and from having a say. So that's a huge problem that's been, that's um, affected all of our student associations on so many levels uh, and that hasn't properly been redressed. But um, we, as a collective, we're starting to come together and have those hard conversations with those in governance positions um, so that they, they're starting to actually hear our concerns. And that's why I love Fidi Ngaro, which was the, the model we talked about before. Um, that's a way forward to actually building those stronger partnerships that are actually authentic and, and allow us to be heard. Um, another big problem for Māori student leaders that sit at the governance level is that um, we often find that our engagement is quite tokenized. So in my experience, I found that um, I was really only put in some rooms just to tick the box, just to say, oh yeah, a Māori student came in here um, and it was a part of the discussions and yep, it's fine. Um, and that was something that was quite hard because as, as I said before, I came in quite green to this role. I didn't even recognize it for a few weeks there. So it took me um, some training from outside sources to recognize, hey, you know, I'm actually being used in some of these meetings. And so that was a big problem with Māori student leaders as they felt that yes, their, their engagement was tokenized in some ways. Um, a big issue that's come up lately is that most of our leaders are not compensated for, for taking on leadership roles or it's not enough. Um, so just a few weeks ago, we had a Māori student leader um, that actually resigned from her role because uh, she wasn't getting paid at the same amount that the Pākehā, that the non-Māori student leader was being paid. Um, this is a very brief overview. There's a lot of history there, but you know, I got to a point where our Māori student leaders don't want to do this work anymore because they see that their, their non-Māori peers are being um, honoured or are being valued at are being valued at a different rate to them. And that makes them, you know, it just makes them want to disengage really. Um, I'm trying to make this more positive. I'm trying to make this more positive. But um so we go to the Māori student voice, yes, I realise we're coming yeah, close to the um, try, I'm gonna try to leave you guys with some opportunities. I see that SVA is in the and its formative stages. So if I could offer any guidance, it would be that when you are, as you're putting in your structures in place, um, making sure that it's an authentic partnership it's rather than a, just a one way, you know, you come sit in this meeting and we'll give you this plan and, and you, you know, if you just say yes or no, actually allowing Indigenous students to be a part of the build. Um, that was one of our big points that came across in, our, in my years and in my experience doing Māori student associations. Um, making sure that yeah, students are compensated. I know, I'm not sure if they touched on this earlier, but that was one of our huge problems is that um, students didn't want to, Māori students that had the capabilities to be leaders didn't but because they didn't see any value to it when they weren't being um, you know, properly compensated for actually taking on a huge role and responsibility. So that was a huge problem that we came and saw um, that that could be redressed. Um, yeah, I do think I did spew quite a lot of information out. So I'll, hold, I'll wait for the Q and A's. But um, in regards to Maori student voice, we were we're quite lucky to have had um, a huge history of our our tuakana, our elders, our older generations having fought a lot of the hard battles, having done heaps of the protests um, to get to a point where at our governance level, they were actually, they, um, we've built relationships with them and we've started these conversations, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. So that's the big thing I wanted to get across is, yeah, there's so many points that our students complain about year on year um, that just haven't been changed yet. And if in SVA moving forward and, 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 you know, setting some some structures in place. I, I just recommend taking note of some of those barriers we experience because even though it's Maori and we're on a different island, uh, I am it could easily happen to the same First Nations students over there. And so that was something that we quite easily picked up on that there were um, consistent things. But thank you guys for listening to me, and I'll pass it over to the next panelist, Kilda. Um, yeah, so a big thank you for sharing your experience and your story. I thought it was um, fascinating and I wish we had a lot more time because it would be uh, great to hear a lot more about um, the experience there. And I'm sure others um, in the session would agree. Um, so if we move now to the third panellist, um, we've got Dr Charlene Leroy Dyer, who's the Associate Prime Director for Indigenous Engagement at the School of Business in the University of Queensland. Um, and also immediate past president of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Postgraduate Association. 
Um, so I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, Heather. Warimi Ngani, Naya Charlene, Garigal, Garinga, Dara Guratri, Wabakal. Um, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, um, Carmen. I'm also on Gobi Gobi country, though I work at UQ on the lands of the Turbo and Yagara peoples. Um, I'm just sitting here listening to our um, sister from across the ditch, thinking how much uh, is what you're going through in New Zealand is exactly what we go through here. You know, um, the tokenism, the being undervalued, underpaid. And, um, and I was thinking about what Keenan was saying too, like NUS, our National Union of Students a few years ago, um, decided that um, the Indigenous officer shouldn't get paid anymore. So, you know, that's... Um, pretty awful but yeah so I was I was kind of thinking about that as we were talking um, so I just want to talk a little bit about myself and our organization and what we actually do so um, I myself have been in student politics for over 20 years um, and that was when I first came to be an undergraduate student at the University of Newcastle and I noticed that some people are on on there from uh, University of Newcastle um, and when I came into the university, we didn't have uh, positions on the student associations for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So I remember one day going on to our, uh, it was called Noosa at the time, and um, going on to Noosa and saying, well, why isn't there an Aboriginal position? And they, then they said, well, why should there be? Um, and so it was, it was this justification about why Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as sovereign peoples of this country should have a space in student politics and representing students throughout the university. Um, so through my undergraduate degree and um, I was always on the, the student union. And then when I became a postgraduate, I had to go through the exact same thing. So our postgrad association at that time had an equity officer, but there was no Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representation. So I went along to the AGM and I'm saying, why is there no representation? And so they quickly changed the constitution and made a position. Um, and I was the inaugural Aboriginal per person on that um, committee. Then I went on to become president of that association. But I think that one of the things that we need to think about as um, Aboriginal people is that sometimes we're an afterthought when it comes to um, student um, voices. And I think that there are a lot of gaps that we have where we need to have a voice and how we actually progress that. So when I was in the Postgrad Student Association, um, I decided that I wanted to have a voice nationally. And we have two um, postgraduate student associations in Australia. One is the Council of Australian Postgraduates and one is NATSIPA. So I was the, um, I went on to Kappa and then I was talking at, at Kappa, um, holding a different position. And then I went on to be their, their National Aboriginal Officer. And I held that position for seven years, um, which ironically, um, it was really hard to get other students to step on, up into that position. And I wanted to actually touch on why that is. And um, I was thinking about this in two aspects. One is that sometimes when we're on these um, committees or bodies, whether it be student um, within universities or whether it be national, sometimes it's a tokenistic gesture. You know, you know let's have a, an Aboriginal person or let's have a Maori person, but that person's not really listened to or they're not actually given anything substantial to do in that role. And I think that that's a real um, missed opportunity for um, those organisations. And secondly, I think about, you know, the commitments that mm -hmm. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students have within their families, within their communities, and the fact that we only have 3% population. Sometimes it's very hard to get people to actually step up because of their commitments. So I was kind of thinking along those lines when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today. And um, 
you know, in Natsipa, for instance, I'm the immediate past president. I was a president for a few years and it was very difficult to find people to actually step up into that role because of all the different obligations that we have. Um, and so I was just thinking about, you know, how, how far we've come over the 20 years that I've been in student politics and advocating for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. And back in the day, like we, we basically didn't have very many voices, but today, thankfully, we have voices such as um, Nazi Pass sits on the TEXA Student Export Advisory Group. So TEXA is the um, Tertiary Education Quality Standards Australia. And so we have a voice on there to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices are heard right throughout tertiary education sector. Um, and Keenan will say, you know, Keenan sits on there as far as you access goes. You know, we do have Student Voice Australia and we thank Student Voice Australia for actually ensuring that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices are heard and that's really important. Um, we, have the, we have CAPA, which is the Council of Australian Postgraduates, where Nancy Pass sits on as well. But we also sit on the um, Minister's Student Advisory Group and that's only such a new group that was formed last year where we actually have a voice straight to the Minister. And that's the first time ever that we've been heard singularly at a national level, level and had the minister listening to what we need to say. And I think that when I think about student organisations and how far they've come, they've still got a long way to go. We're still sometimes seen as tokenist, but I think that we're actually moving in the right direction. So um, that's, that's enough for me. Well, thank you very much for sharing your point of view. Um, I am conscious of time. I think we have 10 minutes left. Um, just so you're aware, there's four questions in the um, Q&A. Um, I can read them out, but if anyone wants to answer, if we can keep the answers to a couple of minutes, it might mean we can get through the four that are there. Um, so the first one is, um, how do you make goals achievable and get First Nations people's needs on the agenda and not get stuck in the bureaucracy of the institution? Does anyone want to have a go at answering that? I'll have a go. Okay. <laughs> I think one of the things is that we have to be really vocal. And, um, before, before coming here, I was actually in the executive committee of my university because we're putting together a RAP implementation plan. Um, and if we don't actually step up and we don't actually voice what we need, then we're never going to be heard. But I think it's about having people ready to step up and say, this is what we need and doing that in, consult in consultation with our um, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students because sometimes it does get bogged down. And unless we keep pushing, and I think that that's one of the things about um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and I'm sure it's the same for Māori, is that we have to actually do that initiative. We have to actually say, well, hey, you have to listen to us. We have to progress it. And we have to be sometimes really, um, oh God, I'm trying to think of the right word, but we have to actually, push, push, push. And if we don't push, then we don't get anywhere. So I think it's about making sure that um, our voices are there in the first place and then putting everything on the agenda and not going away until somebody actually listens to us. Okay, well, thank you very much for responding to that question, Charlene. Um, the next one is, how can educators and student affairs professionals be proactive in making sure systems are accepting of and empowering for First Nations students, their perspectives and experiences? What kind of questions do you ask when looking at policies and procedures? Does anyone want to have a go at responding to that question? I can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think the first tip would be our institutions and our organisations in particular need to acknowledge that there is, there is, in some instances, structural racism there. I think, you, you know, before we even start trying to build relationships with Indigenous students, um, you need to acknowledge 
um, the historical context and all of the different determinants that have impacted on the sh on students uh, before they even get in the door. Um, and you know, once you do that, once you acknowledge it and you understand it, that's that's when you can then work in partnership with our Indigenous students um, to empower them. And um, that is something we've been a little bit caught up in on our end. Is there some? There's some, you know, <laughs> getting. I'm being wary <laughs> of the audience. Um, you know, some some institutions and some professionals aren't aren't willing to make that first step just to acknowledge racism and to acknowledge the impacts that you know and the different um, the negative experiences that um, our Indigenous students have had, and and that's a huge barrier to empowering them is not accepting that hey maybe you know some of these institutions were made to colonize our students, and that's that's something that, that needs to be acknowledged before we can do anything, before we can empower them and put them into positions um, and you know, ask their perspectives and, and, and for their experiences. Um, I might throw it over if anyone else has anything to add to that too. Can I talk on this as well? Um, I'd also like to focus more on that kind of the perspectives and experiences, like putting value on our lived experiences. And even our knowledge is like as First Nations people, um, we come with a diff like a with a with a different, I guess, perspective and different lived experiences. And often I don't think that our experiences as First Nations people is, is really considered or really taken, um, what's the right word? Like is really I often I think it's overlooked. Like even like when it comes to embedding knowledge as sorry knowledge is into a like um, into universities like I don't even think that's con like it's not even taken seriously like often when I've put it into like assignments and stuff like that like I don't even think it's really noted or and it, and it's not even encouraged like in a lot of courses that I've that I've done like I'm doing an environmental sciences degree and we're learning about the Australian environment and the fact that I've had little to no um, First Nations content in my degree is embarrassing, really. Like the fact that we're learning about like like our environment, and I guess I don't want to pigeonhole like First Nations people into being caretakers of the environment because that's just one of our many roles. But the fact that we're not even being considered, or like an, an example of this is when there was a um, a timeline shown of um ten thousand years in terms of land usages in Europe, and then ten thousand years in Australia. For 9,800 years, they put us down as hunter-gatherers. And then over in Europe, there was like the Bronze Age, this and that. And just like how demeaning that was just to be called hunter-gatherers, you know, like, and this is within universities. Um, I think educators and student affairs professionals should honestly really look at these policies and procedures and identify what in these policies and procedures actually cause harm to us and how can they be changed or removed. But yeah, that's all I have to say. All right, well, thank you both for your responses. I know we've got about four minutes left and there's three more questions. So we might tackle at least one more. Um, so what's the best way in your opinion to promote diversity within student representative bodies and ensure First Nations students are included and represented without it becoming tokenistic? I'm happy to talk to that one. Um, I think that I've, you know, done I've done a fair bit of work around this one at a um, university and a national level, and I think it's all about ensuring that if we have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or Maori people on these committees, that they actually have tangible things that they're doing that progress um, the agendas of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students or of, of Maori students, um, and I think that that's one of the major things. Like. Um, just imagine you're a president of a student association. You have a portfolio of things that you need to do. And that's the same for us, you know. Consult with your student cohorts and see what are the goals that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students or Maori students need within that, you know, um, community. And then actually do tangible goals that somebody's got, got ownership of. Because if we don't have ownership of our own staff, um, and then, you know, that is tokenistic then. So, I mean, that's my take. Okay, well, thank you for that response, um, Charlene. I think we only have a, probably a minute and a half. I'm just conscious of the next session um, and respecting the time of the next people. Can I just check if we need to wrap up now? 
I think we've probably got time for another question. Okay, great. Sorry about that then. Um, so if we move to the next question, what do you do when your role is purely advisory as, as well? Um, can you still achieve change within a campus? Does anyone want to respond to that one? Um, I can speak to that. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm fortunate enough from my student association work, um, I've been recently appointed to a minister, uh, ministerial advisory group that's focused on tertiary education for Māori. Um, so I know exactly what that feels like um, being on an advisory group um, and being the student voice really. And um, it's, it is hard because what we say and the recommendations we put ac across there's actually no guarantee that the ministers are going to listen to it. Um, but how we work it is we, we recognize that um, it's still it's still a position of value and even you know even though if our budget bids don't go through or you know stuff like that doesn't happen we're still putting the the, the corridor that we're still putting these um the it's hard I'm trying to think what's the English equivalent to corridor we're still putting the um the kaupapa on on the table and sorry I, I realize I use too much Maori in my, in my descriptions but um we see value in advisory work, um, and especially in my role, in that um, it's even though there's no guarantee that you know you might get get what you want across the line, um, it's still the fact that you're doing it and you're putting it out there is, is a huge move enough. You know that's that's a huge step in, in comparison to not doing anything and, and not having an advisory group there to talk to our ministers about what needs to be done in tertiary education, um, and so that's that's hopefully answers some of your question, but I'll see if any of my peers want to answer it as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that you're totally right about that. But I do want to say one thing, please don't ever apologise for using your language. Because in Australia, we have very few of it. And it would be, you know, I love, I love to hear Murray talk. So yeah, just going to say that. Yeah, I echo that as well. And um, I'd just like to say a really big thank you um, to everyone who shared their um, stories and experience in this panel. It's been um, fascinating and I've certainly learnt a lot. And um, if time allowed, I'd love to keep listening for hours more. Um, I think it's fantastic that there has been a First Nations panel um, session in the Student Voice Australia Symposium, particularly as it's the start of Reconciliation Week today. Um, and I'll hand back over now to Philippa. Thank you so much, Heather, and also Keenan Mamaro and Charlene. That was an absolutely fantastic um, panel session. Thank you for sharing your reflections and really your very personal reflections and journeys and experiences with us. Um, I, I, I think I can speak for everybody to, you know, in saying how much we do appreciate that. And um, I think what you've certainly reminded me is of, you know, the, the challenges and barriers. Um, you've also reminded me of the, the, I think somebody, perhaps it was Mamara, who, who sort of said this isn't just a, you know, this isn't just a, a story of difficulty, it's also a story of change and evolution and a kind of positive direction of travel, which I think is great, but you've certainly given me a, a lot of food for thought, and not least about what the Student Voice Australia itself as a network can and should be doing as we try to um, empower and assist students and institutions to address uh, the kinds of barriers and experiences that you've been talking about. So <clears throat> thank you tremendously for that. It's hugely appreciated. 